live with the chalice cam. What I have are words from Wendell Berry, The Peace of Wild Things. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood duck rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Thank you, Harvey. And now uh, our affirmation will appear on the screen and let's read together. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. And now let us turn to our joys and concerns. A ritual called the fabric of life. And the idea is, is to recognize somebody, remember somebody who's been significant in our lives in some way. <clears throat> so today we were doing that again because it is the last Sunday of January, which is hard to believe. And if we usually say the person's name and then we say, I weave this thread in the fabric of our life in remembrance of. So uh, we, I'll say that once again for you. I weave this thread in the fabric of our life in remembrance of. So if anybody has somebody they want to remember, please say something and we can take a piece of, oh, I have to show you what we'll do. We're going to take a piece of, of string. We're going to put it through our fabric here. As you can see, it's getting very full. The other side is completely full. So it's going through <laughs> beautifully. So let's, um, does anybody have somebody they would love to remember today? I do. Go ahead. Um, I'd like to remember a good friend of mine, Calvin Krantz from Berrien Springs. He was in his 50s, oh. uh, suddenly died um, this last, in the last couple of weeks. Um, he was a joy and a light to thousands of people. He was quite a comedian, very kind, very giving. Thank you. And we all say, and of course, there's nobody here today, but we all say presente. That is recognized. Presente. 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 And then we take the flat fabric of this light and we put it through one of these holes here, which adds to this beautiful fabric of life, as you see it here, that we have hanging in our, in our sanctuary and uh, should be admired every time we're here on a Sunday morning. So does anybody else have something they'd like to say? Lisa Quinlan, did you have your hand up? Well, I'd like to uh, remember my father who died uh, 12 years ago. Uh, and I will be speaking of him later on in the service. So I would like to remember him. His name? My, his name is William McConnell. Presente. Presente. And I will take this fabric of life and put it through in one here. This is for William McConnell's father.
Whoops. There's two of them in there. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, sure. Um, hey. hi. Yeah, hi. This is Steve. I'd like to put out a remembrance for my mother-in-law, Pearl. She passed away last Thursday night. Um, her name was Pearl Johnson. She was 86. She raised a family of three in Michigan. And uh, the family this weekend is preparing for her funeral next Friday. So, uh, yeah, that's what I'd like to offer. Presente. Hey. I'd like to add one. Sorry, sorry, lost, Steve. Go ahead, Beth. Um, I'd like to put in honor of Silas Keys. He's not someone I know personally. He is a seventh grader who passed in a, a rather tragic car accident. He and his father were killed in a car accident uh, earlier this year, and his younger brother was hospitalized. I don't know if he is still hospitalized, um, but he had rather severe injuries as well. And the funeral for Silas was held yesterday. He's, yeah, he was only 12 um, mm -hmm. when he died. Oh my goodness. Presente. 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 And here's for this young, young person. In remembrance. Anyone else? They were, <clears throat> this past week, we've been talking about the Holocaust and how so many people are denying it or in denial. And so, and so they were recognizing it for, <clears throat> for these many years ago, which I remember distinctly myself being <laughs> in the Navy, I think at the time, so I would like to remember all those people, all the victims of the Holocaust, those many years ago. Presente. 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 Thanks, Gloria. Is that it? Thank you, Gloria. Thank you. And let's uh, now move to our offering. The words will appear on your screen and we can repeat them together. This fellowship is the community of ourselves. Its resources are our resources. Its wealth is what we share. As we contribute to the life of this community, we affirm our life within it. And thank you all for your generosity. And now our offering music. Thank you. 
don't fear when you're holding me. Morning will come and I'll do what's right. Just give me till then to give up this fight. And I will Thank you, Candace. That was quite beautiful. And now our story for all ages. Beth, if you want to play that for us. Oh, this coming uh, Saturday, my wife, Pat, and I will celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary, as I mentioned earlier. When I was younger and newly married, I was something of an expert on marriage. Now that I and Patty approach 50 years together, I have much less to say. A person that has been helpful in understanding what happens in courtship and marriage is the psychologist Melanie Klein. Her main idea is that the notion is the notion that different dynamics of the human psyche can be thought of as distinct objects for the purpose of understanding what is occurring in the psyche. Her psychology is called objects relation theory and describes how these object slash dynamics of the psyche interact with each other and with the objects in other people. It's a little like organic chemistry, which is about the interaction of organic molecules. It turns out that falling in love, courtship and marriage have a bit of both organic chemistry and object relations theory going on. During courtship and the early days of marriage, the pituitary gland secretes a hormone called oxytocin, <clears throat> also known as the love hormone, that blinded us, blinders us to some of the less attractive character traits of our lovers. This is probably nature's way of ensuring the survival of the species, so that lovers will have a very rosy, though somewhat unfocused picture of each other. After marriage, less attractive character traits soon emerge, so that eventually the spouses we choose come into focus as the somewhat more complex and difficult human beings we all are. The mythologist Joseph Campbell said, marriage is not a love affair. Marriage is an ordeal. It means yielding time and time again. It's a sacrament. You give up your personal simplicity to participate in a relationship. And when you are giving, you are not giving to the other person, you are giving to the relationship, uh, end of quote. What did Campbell mean when he said marriage is a sacrament? A sacrament is a means of and a sign uh, of divine grace. Marriage then is a means of grace. It is between two people a foundation from which to grow and become. One thing I think I know for sure is that people change. The people Pat and I were 50 years ago are not the same people we are now, which is a good thing. I don't think I would like some parts of the 50 years ago me if I were to meet him now. I have on occasion been asked if I have ever been divorced. I respond I'm still married to the same woman, but over the years to several different persons. For 50 years of marriage, about 50% 50 50 of marriages end up in divorce. This is not a bad thing. What is surprising to me is given the demands of marriage and the initial intoxicating effects of oxytocin, that 50% of marriages survive. There have been some times in our marriage when I'm pretty sure that Patty and I would have gladly cashed in our chips and happily walked away. Maybe we didn't because we were just so exhausted from holding down our jobs, maintaining a household and raising four kids that we didn't have the energy. Or maybe there was enough grace there that we were able to muddle through. Thankfully, when the kids left home and successfully began their adult lives, things between Patty and I were much easier. We discovered that we liked and enjoyed each other very much. That being said, when people decide to end marriages, there are often feelings of guilt involved. Should I have stuck it out? Am I getting divorced for the right reason? By choosing divorce, have I hurt my kids? Should I have given my partner another chance? I want to talk about guilt a bit. To do that, I need to shift gears. For years, I have carried considerable guilt over my relationship with my father, who is now deceased. I did not know when I set off for seminary that that experience 
would have such a profound effect on my way of thinking about life. It was difficult for my father when I said, decided to go to a seminary. He had often said, if you can't do teach, if you can't teach, preach, meaning professional ministry is for the incompetent and ineffective. In seminary, I began to process, been the process of examining my map of life. A lot of landmarks on my map I had inherited uncritically from my father, and he had inherited uncritically from his. Part of how my dad propped him, himself up psychologically was through bigotry. His bigotry took the form of hating Jews, Blacks, Democrats, feminists, intellectuals, the wrong-headed people who lived in the cities, and those damn Arabs. That's a quote. I foolishly entered into my many conversations with my dad on his bigotry and how hating other people was somewhat of a contradiction with the teachings of the Christian church. Dad never missed a Sunday at church and was one of the church's most prominent supporters. My dad did not have the privileges that I had. He was not lucky enough to get an education that might have helped him understand his bigotry. If I remember our discussions, I still feel some guilt for challenging him. What I have learned is that guilt is a gift, that if one sits with one's guilt, it is a powerful teacher and an invitation to freedom. Over the years, guilt has helped me to realize that I too was an otherizer, that I was just another kind of bigot. I was bigoted towards bigots and that I was using my liberal view of life to otherize people who I disagreed with politically and theologically. The temptation is still with me to big, the temptation is still with me to be bigoted towards people who become belligerent are commercial on, uh, on commercial airline planes, our airlines, because they don't want to wear masks, people who wear mega hats, and people who sit in state houses crafting voter suppression bills. Guilt has taught me that we are a fragile and dangerous species and that there really is no, uh, no other. There is just us. Guilt has taught me the best response to life is grace for everyone, even the most unrepentant terrorists. Grace for everyone is the core of our first UU principle, the inherent worth and dignity of everyone. Life is much fuller when we meet it with grace and stop the judging. If guilt comes to you, invite it in. Ask it, what do I need to learn from you? Let's now move to Michelle, who will talk about divorce and loneliness, and then to Glenn and Lisa Q, who will share their perspectives on loneliness. Michelle, go ahead, please. Good morning. So I, I wrote this and then I was looking at it and thinking, well, is this, is this really what I was supposed to be talking about? But I was like, you know, it's buff, it'll be fine. So, <laughs> all right, so divorce is not easy even when it is the right decision. After more than 25 years of marriage, I moved out of our family home when our daughter Katie went to college in the fall of 2017. This had been my plan for a few years and both Katie and my husband Steve, who some of you know, were aware. Steve and I are still friends and he is a good guy, so I won't share the details about our marriage or divorce. But I can safely say that we both felt lonely in our relationship. However, Katie made us a family of three and we couldn't feel to too lonely with her bright loving spirit around and those of you who no, Katie, you could probably see that easily. We kept the marriage going for the sake of Katie and because it was comfortable. However, neither of us was fulfilled. Obviously, all divorces are not the same. There are different reasons, situations, and feelings involved. Conflicting emotions are very common when someone decides to end a long-term relationship. This could include a mixture of fear, sadness, guilt, anger or grief and loneliness is also a normal part of divorce but here's a distinction that i want to make there is a difference between being alone and feeling lonely being alone is an observable fact that nobody else is around and you are by yourself but loneliness is an emotion a feeling of sadness about being isolated from others you don't have to be alone to feel lonely in fact, as many of us know, you can feel lonely in a crowd. And on the flip side of that, you can be completely by yourself but not feel sad about it. 
I felt lonely in my marriage, but when I moved into my own place, I felt happy and alive despite being alone. I relished the quiet and my independence. I spent the first year after my divorce staying busy painting and making my house into my home. I threw myself into volunteering and spending time with friends. But as the home projects dwindled and the novelty wore off, loneliness began to creep in. I miss sharing with someone the things about my day or talking about events on the news. When I took a spill on my basement stairs, I realized that being alone could even be scary. So I decided to enter the intimidating world of online dating. After several months, I began seeing someone who had very different beliefs than I did. But I enjoyed his company and we had a lot of fun together, so I stuck it out. I thought we might be okay if we just didn't talk about politics or current events, but that was tricky. How could we really ignore the historic issues happening in our world? And wasn't sharing these experiences with someone part of feeling connected? So even together, I began to feel somewhat lonely again. We broke up once for several months, but a greater loneliness brought me back to that relationship. We made it seven more months before I finally recognized that being by myself was actually preferable to tolerating negativity and jeopardizing my principles. Like my divorce, this was the correct decision, but difficult and full of conflicting emotions again. My soul is much lighter now, but I am alone again. I might actually feel lonelier now than I did after my divorce. I'm not embracing this sadness, but I have accepted it. I have even gone so far as to tell myself in the mirror that it's okay to feel lonely. It was better than the alternative of staying in that relationship. For some reason, that acceptance uh, makes me feel less overwhelmed by just telling myself in the mirror, it's okay, you know, it, it's just normal, you'll, you'll get through this. Uh, many people settle for unfulfilling relationships for fear of being by themselves. That's a personal decision and I completely understand it, but I am committed to not allow this to be my path. Fortunately, I enjoy my own company and tend to be somewhat introverted. Uh, plus my full-time job keeps me busy and tired. I have returned to my original plan to spend time with friends and volunteer. I've set a goal for myself to have at least one social outing a week and one volunteer opportunity a month. I'm also venturing out to do things by myself and keeping a list of these accomplishments. Uh, these plans take effort, especially in the winter months when I would rather put on my fuzzy robe and just stay home. But my hope is to remain positive and engaged with the world. I don't know what the future holds for me, but even if I'm alone, I'm going to work on hard. Thank you. And thank you, Michelle. That was uh, very lovely. I appreciate that. I also love those words. Don't, don't worry. Uh, it, don't. It'll be okay. It's buff. So uh, that's a, a motto to live by, I think. So uh, and now uh, Glenn Smith will share with us. Uh, Glenn, can you share? I can, and I kind of wish I'd gone first because most of my points have already been taken. But here we go. <laughs> I was born on a summer day, 1962, in Lincoln, Nebraska, as a matter of fact, because that's where my father was stationed with the Air Force. When my father left the Air Force, he and my mom started college. We moved seven times by the time I was 12. As a shy boy, it was difficult for me because it seemed like I would just be making progress at making friends when we'd move away again. I spent a lot of time alone. I read a lot worked a lot of crossword and other types of puzzles. Typical things one does when one's alone. I thought loneliness and being alone were the same thing. We moved to Troy, Alabama when I was 12. And as a still shy boy, I made a few good friends and was excited not to have to leave them and restart after a couple of years. I was occasionally lonely, but not very often and not very long. In retrospect, maybe I was more bored than lonely. Just having good friends reduced my loneliness even when I was alone. Maybe loneliness and being alone aren't as closely tied as I had thought they were. 
while I was finishing my bachelor's degree and working on my first professional job, I got married. We moved away from Alabama to start graduate school. I felt lonely sometimes, but chalked it up to being so busy with school. I thought that once I finished school, we'd settle into a happily married life. After I finished graduate school and started working, we found that we didn't have a lot in common. I wanted to follow where my career led and she wanted to go back to Troy. I wanted to travel on vacation and she wanted to go back to Troy. I wanted to go hiking and she wanted to stay home. It was the loneliest time of my life. I didn't understand how I could be lonely when I lived with someone. I found that I'm lonelier when I'm around somebody but not engaged than I am when I'm alone. We lived separately, we lived separately together. I filled in my loneliness, spending most of my time working. I worked a full-time position and also worked another full-time consulting. Then in 2010, within the course of a month, one of my uncles was killed in a car accident. A co-worker who is my age died of a heart attack. A friend of mine uh, from junior high in Troy died of a heart attack, and another friend of mine from Troy committed suicide. Within a month, all of this happened. I decided it was time to stop working all the time and being miserable and to do things that made me happy. So I got a divorce, cut way back on my consulting, and took up kayaking. I was alone more, but not nearly as lonely as I had been. Kayaking turned out to be perfect for me. You can do it alone or with others. That's when I met Susie. We kayaked together and soon moved in together. Within a year, we moved into a motorhome and began traveling. I did follow my career by joining T-Mobile and we do travel. I didn't move to Seattle, but it was a huge step up professionally. We've been to all 50 states and we have friends all across the US, including quite a few in Michigan. My entire life changed for the better, but nothing's perfect. I still feel lonely sometimes when we're at home and Susie's working on her computer. I'll ask her a question and her, her answer will be a half a sentence or not have anything to do with what I asked. When that happens, I know she's more engaged with something online than with me and that I need to find something else to do. Earlier this week, I wrote a program to calculate letter frequencies for five letter words for Wordle. I got her attention when I mentioned that Y is the most common final consonant for five letter words. I also walk with our four-legged furry anti-loneliness ambassador when I feel this way. I'm still more lonely when I'm around people but not engaged with them than I am when I'm alone, but I'm getting better. And for those Thank of you who didn't recognize this, my opening line was the opening line from the song Lonely Boy by Andrew Gold. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. We know a little more about you now and also about the letter Y. So we appreciate it very much. So, you know, I don't uh, even play Wordle. <laughs> I didn't even, I'd never heard of it. Um, would uh, Lisa Quinlan, would you like to speak next? Yeah, go ahead. Um, years ago, I read a tragic story about a lady named Pia Farikoff, who was discovered five years after she died, mummified in the back seat of her car in her garage. No one realized she had died. Her bills were paid automatically from her bank. Can you imagine? As social connections break apart, these stories become more widespread. People today have fewer social ties. When I was young, I remember neighbors hanging out in the 70s. It just seemed things worked different then. One study in New York Times pointed out that people lack proximity, repeated unplanned interactions and settings that encourage people to let their guard down and confide in each other. All these studies say making friends has become a lot harder since 1950. The survey Center of American Life found that 49% of Americans have less than three close friends. Another study said that one out of four people in America have no one at all to confide in. 
the pandemic wiped away a lot of people's social lives and interaction. It's been difficult for me because I was in a lot of groups and community things that was a big part of my social life. Our social ties were taken away from relaxing times at club meetings to feeling safe down at the corner pub. In my early 20s, there was a period where I had absolutely no one on this earth. College folks had moved away. I had graduated. I had not met Ralph quite yet. I was living alone. I had left my woman's boarding house to live in my own, own apartment while working long hours. One weekend still haunts me to this day. There was no one to call. The walls of my apartment pressed in, and it actually brought panic. I was like the 70s cartoon Ziggy, character Ziggy without a goldfish or a little dog to talk to. It was just me there all alone and nobody to talk to. Life changes like graduation, shyness, divorce, losing a job, poverty, homelessness, disability, hearing loss, fatigue, caretaking, being widowed, childlessness, and growing older can make people feel isolated and alone. There is an online elder orphan movement I've had on contact with on in Facebook. It's for older people who have no families and have no children or spouses who are out in the world alone. The internet often has been used as a place for lonely people to seek companionship and things like that. In fact, I have, I have quite a rich online social life I developed too, especially, you know, because I've been disabled so many years. Some people are lonely because everyone moved away or they had to move. I was moved constantly as a child when people ask me, where are you from? I have a hard time answering where. My old small rural town wilted on the economic vine back in the around 2000s and was wiped away what many thought would be their forever home. That included me at the time. Some people don't have families either via death, domestic violence, or estrangement. One of my friends, who was one of my closest friends in life, um, was abandoned, she's deceased, she died a couple months ago, was abandoned on a doorstep as a baby. It would impact her life immensely. Some of those things happen to people where you're not starting off with the same resources as others. Grief can make people lonely where you miss people who are no longer here. It's a different kind of loneliness where you're thinking, you know, of everyone that's been lost or friends who have died and, and their family. Some leave behind old social lives to seek sobriety or recovery. You know, sometimes your group of friends that you've been drinking with or other things, it doesn't work anymore. Some also can stand alone for various causes or where you're the one person in the crowd on your own. Um, how many lonely people eat their cup of soup or sandwich in front of their blaring TV at night with no one to share the hours and thoughts of their life with? One thing to remember is don't blame yourself. You are not alone in being alone. Lonely in a crowd among the chattering masses or people you don't connect to is a reality as well. Some religions honor, uh, honor alone time as time to go within see, and seeking contact with the divine to meditate and pray. That can be an escape for lonely people and where you look into the spiritual aspects of solitude. Um, one thing too, be your own friend. If you're your only friend right now, step back and ask yourself, what do I want to do today? How can I be a friend to myself? What will make me happy? Try to consider the positives of solitude instead of thinking of how lonely you are. Um, one thing that's a good thing for artists, we need a lot of alone time to get stuff done. You better like being alone if you if having solitude sometimes to get enough art projects done. There should be a community effort to reach out to the lonely. One park set up benches where lonely people could sit and wait and they had people to speak with them. Programs have paired seniors for companionship with college students. I think all those things are important. Being lonely can harm your health. We need more focus on community and community building in our society. Damage from COVID will need undone. Some are questioning the isolation of modern life and are exploring new options like intentional communities and co-housing. 
I've had an interest in those in those kind of things too myself. Many as uh, many of us have sought and found community at birth. One way to handle loneliness is telling yourself, "I am enough because you are." Look for your worth from inside, not seeking validation from others. Your social needs may be different. So what if you're not a party person? Not everyone is a social butterfly. Find people who celebrate your quirks who aren't annoyed by them. Maybe you don't fit in with a crowd. Look for those like yourself. With the internet and such, you can find people who are into all sorts of things. Take time to reach out. If you know your mental health is suffering, try and reach out to other people. I've had friends um, during all of this with the isolation where we've had regular emails and stuff. Tell them you need company. Some will be happy you ask. Look for connection at any age, but with your desire for new friends, also address what your own social needs are and desires are and what you have to give. People pleasing won't work. Lonely people need love and kindness. That lonely person may be your new companion. There needs to be a focus on community building, a focus on inclusion of the lonely, young and old. A part of social justice is seeking connection with others. How do we start to rebuild a society where we don't feel so alone and afraid and where we can form healthier bonds? How do we build a society where we look for happiness in one another rather than in consumption? Johan Harry, Chasing the Scream, The First and Last Days of the War on Drugs. This author also wrote a pretty good book called Lost Connections about how connections and um, social isolation is increasing in America. Okay, thanks. And thank you, Lisa, for that very informative and thoughtful uh, presentation on loneliness. Uh, with that, our, uh, Chalice Extinguishing, Harvey, if you could, please. I will extinguish. I, I have words, uh, <clears throat> unless you, uh, you have words. No, please go ahead. I, 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 I thought your opening words were great. <laughs> okay. Go now in peace. May the spirit of love surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go. Amen. Thank you, Harvey. And now our musical benediction. Peace, friends, and uh, we, uh, those of you who wish, can stick around for Circle Talk, and uh, hopefully Michelle and Lisa uh, and Glenn will stick around so that we can uh, chat with you and talk to you.